Perfect. So that's us recording now. So I just want to say good evening to everyone here present and I hope everyone's doing well despite the pandemic. Um, I'm Mina Sharif, the event coordinator alongside Yash, but unfortunately she can't make it today. Um, I'm also working on the prototype on site and I'll be today's moderator for the seminar. On behalf of my team, I welcome you all to our seventh seminar as a part of the seminar series called Symposium. STEAM is the Solar Decathlon Society of Harriet Watt University. We participate in the SDME competition held in Dubai by building a smart home to tackle problems of climate change. Our aim through Symposium is to elaborate our field of expertise and provide a learning platform about the different technologies, principles and ideologies involved in with STEAM. So we'll be having a particular learning interactive segment at the end of today's seminar where you can ask any question related to the topic to our guest speaker Kelvin. We will also be recording the seminar as well, so if you want to refer to it later or show it to your friends, you can see a snippet of it in our social media platforms or ask us for the recording link via the email. Uh, also, if everyone would like to just put in their email IDs at the chat box, and this way we can send you guys certificates for attending. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest speaker for the seminar today, Kelvin, who will be speaking on solar PCM and thermal energy storage. Kelvin has studied renewable energy engineering from Harry Watt University and is currently working as the renewable energy engineering anal analyst and is the renewables team leader of his team. He will be covering topics like the working principle and the potential of solar PCM and thermal energy and much more. You can drop in any question you might have in the chat box throughout the presentation or raise, raise your virtu virtual hands with the MS team feature on your device and I'm sure Kelvin will be happy to answer them. So over to you Kelvin. Thank you for that introduction Mina. Uh, yep, as um... As, as I said, ask any questions anytime you show up your hands. Uh, I'm just going to go over a few things uh, in terms of the solar thermal system and the PCM storage in particular, uh, looking at phase change materials. So at the moment, I've just got a bit of an agenda for today. I need to, should have changed that date, but otherwise uh, it's all good. Um, so essentially, this is just a quick diagram of uh, a typical solar thermal system that you'd find that uses sensible heat solutions. So essentially, a sensible heat solution is a conventional um, cylindrical hot water tank that you would find in your home. Um, and this is just showing you here how a conventional system would be set up with a controller, usually a differential controller which monitors um, the temperature sense, temperature of the tanks as well as the temperature of the outlet from the solar thermal collectors. So firstly I'm just going to cover a bit on um, the solar thermal system that we're using for the house and particularly the collector and then go over the sun amp heat batteries or the PCM uh, phase change materials uh, as well for the thermal energy storage units. And then after that, I'm going to give a quick brief on exactly the, the system that we're utilising for the team of Steam House um, as well. And at the very end, I'll cover us a little bit on um, how to model it in PolySun. Um, just a short, short demonstration on that. Um, yeah, so uh, any questions again? please just raise your hand during the presentation and I'll just, um, or symposium, sorry, and I'll just begin now. Yeah, so um, for the uh, team of Steam Home, we, we, we obviously want to um, basically support and promote um, Harry Watt startups. And in my final year doing my master's, um, one of my lecturers um, has actually started his own company. Uh, it's a Harry Watt startup known as Solaris Kit. And with becoming more involved in a STEAM and eventually a renewable STEAM leader, I saw it as a great opportunity to introduce technology into the home. So previously we'd be looking at other solar thermal systems um, that were related to the uni known as uh, Soltropy collectors, um, which are were good solar thermal collectors, but they were more suited to colder climates. So basically they were, they were using a, a different type of uh, collector uh, than a flat plate collector. So a flat plate collector would be typ typically a solar thermal collector that you would find in an arid environment or a hot weather climate. Um, the alternate collector that um, was selected prior to Solaris Kit was more of a 
evacuated tube. So it's essentially a working fluid and usually a glycol water mix that would be used to, to basically absorb the thermal energy from the sun. Um, so a bit on the on the working principle of these collectors. Essentially, you have it's, it's very simple mechanical design. There's essentially just um, an absorption tube that um, in this case for the Solaris kit collector, they're a prismic shape, which essentially is just a coil of absorption material, usually in black, so to increase the absorption factors. And essentially it has this special reflect refractive glass to optimize the reflective losses um, and ensure that the, the amount of uh, thermal energy being absorbed by the working fluid is um, roughly about 30 to 40 percent efficiency. That's roughly typically what you get from a flat plate collector um, to ensure that you basically uh, it's heating the cold water supply enough that it becomes between 37 to 40 degrees for your domestic hot water supply. Um, you can obviously store it in a sensible heat solution, which would be a conventional 180 litre water, hot water tank. Um, but for esteem, because we're looking to innovate and um, support um, Scottish and UK businesses, companies that are innovative in the renewable energy and uh, particularly the solar space, we looked at, um, as I'll come on to later, the SunAMP systems, which are thermal energy storage units, but they use a phase change material instead of a sensible heat solution, which would just conventionally be a hot water tank. Um, so just to give you a bit of background, the key parameters really to look at um, for a sol um, solar thermal collector are your stagnation temperature. So that's the temperature of the solar system at periods of uh, no flow conditions. So it's important to handle the stagnation periods accordingly to prevent overheating uh, and damaging of um, subsystems and, and components um, that are in the system. So basically, if you're in stagnation for too long a period, it's essentially overheating and you can damage key components of your system. Um, obviously, you need appropriate um, certification uh, for these collectors, um, either from an improved patent supplier or a regulator. Um, another key parameter to work out the useful um, thermal energy from collectors is the heat loss coefficients. So there's two, there's a first and a second order heat loss coefficient that can vary between collector. Um, so it's important to understand that parameter and um, basically understand what kind of heat losses are um, within the, the system or the collector when it's absorbing thermal energy from the sun. And obviously you want to optimize or ensure that the, the solar thermal collector is in the sun for the longest period of, longest period of time. So what we did with the house, uh, the team at Steam House in particular, is look at the shading um, from the canopy, uh, as you can see in the top right image there, and looking at the placement of the collectors, um, where would be best to place them to minimise the piping and um, also um, ensure that there's minimal shading of the collectors. Uh, so, for example, this only occurs between 9 and 10 at day. Uh, and then because they're on the south facing side where uh, the, the prominent amount of sun is, it gets sunrise, uh, sorry, solar solar gains from sunrise to sunset uh, with minimal shading for about an hour from the um, the canopy there. Um, and on the, this particular um, solar thermal collector that is basically a Herwatt startup and an innovative project that's been, uh, well, granted multiple funds from Innovate UK and uh, um, Scottish Enterprise and um, also like a startup inventor invention of the year is that it's the world's first flat packable um, solar thermal collector. So what I mean by that is essentially you can take this collector, it's fairly flexible in terms of um, you can transport it via your bicycle. And it's been uh, basically the target market for it originally was Rwanda and African communities and looking at um, how can we give African communities or low income households access to free solar energy for as low a cost as possible. So it's been designed with a lot of that in mind. A lot of the components are laser cut um, to create the collector. So it's cheap, easy to manufacture. It's also been designed to be easily in easy to install uh, with only a few installation steps to basically um, reduce the time of installation and as well as the complexity. Um, because conventional flat plate collectors would be Typically, they have to be optimised with the tilt angle um, and also put on the similar to PV panels on the roof. 
So there's a bit more complexity in terms of install and um, designing your system with traditional flat plate collectors, which essentially is just the same um, sort of glass material uh, as a PV panel, but it has copper pipes essentially inside. Uh, and it's important to consider also, of course, the collector area. So the area that's exposed to the solar gains over a period of time. Um, because the more, or sorry, the less area of the absorption material, the absorption piping, um, the more collectors you will need to um, basically match your demand, so your generation demand balance there. And it also comes, of course, with a recommended flow rate and pressure, which is typically a bit free bar. Um, so two of the considerations that we had to do for the house, uh, the same house, was how many collectors do we need, um, which is based obviously on the collector area um, and the amount of time it's exposed to the solar energy from sunrise to sunset. And also, what are the, the gains in Dubai? Luckily in Dubai, they have very good solar gains, uh, very low cloud cover, so that is not less of an issue. Uh, for basically sizing the system for Dubai. So we went uh, with three collectors. Uh, that was our optimal sort of sizing for the amount of thermal energy storage we had. Um, yep, and that's just a bit on the, any questions on the Solaris kit collectors at all? Tell us a note, uh, I'll just go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, essentially when you're, when you're looking at doing solar thermal analysis, you want to look at the steady state um, useful energy transferred to the liquid through a steady state analysis. So essentially, um, you've also got to consider the collector area, um, the absorbed solar irradiance, the overall heat loss coefficient, which is a combination of both the second and sorry the first and second order heat loss coefficients that will usually be specified in the data sheet um, in watts per meter squared Kelvin, and then also the absorber absorber plate temperature. So that's the temperature that um, the absorber gets to, um, and then you've also got to consider the ambient air temperature, of course, as well. And it's essentially the difference between the the, the temperature of the plate and the temperature of the um, outside air for your steady state analysis and that will enable you to work out how much useful energy, how useful thermal energy is transferred to the liquid to create your domestic hot water and from there it's stored um, inside your storage solution, either latent heat or sensible solution. Um, essentially the system is set up with two temperature sensors, a differential controller, a pump system, with a couple of valves as well. Uh, and then of course you're piping from your collectors to your thermal energy storage unit. So essentially you're looking at the temperature difference between the, the collector and the storage system. And typically if that's a temperature difference of six degrees, then that would actuate a pump via the controller. Um, and that would just circulate the water from A to B and transfer through a heat exchanger typically into the thermal energy storage unit. Um, and then you basically have hot water stored. Um, and that would, uh, the differential controller would ensure that that's topped up every every day or every point of the day to make sure you've always got the thermal energy in your, heat, your thermal energy storage unit. So when you have a domestic hot water demand from your shower, your, from your water fixings, that uh, it's instant and hot water comes straight out because it's always uh, stored and regulated at a certain temperature, which is typically for hot water in domestic homes, it's typically between 43 and 47 degrees Celsius. So that's just a bit on um, how the working principle and the equation basically behind how does the uh, collector absorb the thermal energy to create domestic hot water. Yeah, so you're probably asking, why do you need to store uh, thermal energy? So, of course, there is the, obviously, the morning demand and evening demand for hot water. So you're typically going to take a shower in the morning. You're typically going to have a bath at night. You're typically going to have, you know, obviously your dinner at night as well. So there's going to be, uh, your water consumption demand varies from morning to evening. And obviously the solar peak, um, typically, of course, it, it starts off in uh, with low solar gains about more in the morning as the sun rises and then you've got your peak gains during the middle of the day 
So you want to store as much thermal energy as possible so that you have enough uh, energy to give you domestic water in the evening and in the morning. So essentially, um, to basically decarbonize heat in buildings, you want to eliminate uh, in the future natural gas boilers for space heating um, uh, and also you have to take consideration the fact that new gas boilers in the UK won't be sold in new build properties beyond 2025. So a lot of the um, considerations are um, basically how are we going to uh, heat our thermal energy storage without a boiler and the answer to that is using a solar thermal collector or a flat, either flat plate or evacuated tube collector. So basically the, the purpose of the thermal energy storage unit is obviously to ensure that you can get your domestic hot water demand at any time of the day. Um, so essentially it's a, it's a three-step process when you're looking at charging, storing and discharging. So it's, it's usually by a heat exchanger, um, the charge phase, charge phase you, you transfer the heat to the storage material or the storage medium which is either water for the sensible heat solution or a phase change material. And then that, that storage phase is for a certain amount of time. You have to consider the heat loss um, factors for storage systems. So obviously your, your hot water tank or your PCM is not going to stay hot forever. Um, it's, once it's fully charged, it will dissipate heat um, over a certain amount of period. Um, and then obviously you have to understand how many times you're going to discharge each day um, the phase um, change material or the storage medium for uh, the sensible heat solution. So this is just a, a quick overview. As I've mentioned before, there's the sensible heat solution, uh, which is typically a hot water tank, uh, and then your latent heat storage, which is a, it's a phase change material. So essentially, um, you have the solidification process of the material. So if you ever came across um, these uh, hand warmer packs that you get uh, in the winter, essentially you put a pressure or a heat source onto it and it solidifies or it, um, it reduces the, it solidifies the material, which means it releases heat. So it starts off as a liquid when it's um, discharged, um, sorry, um, charged, fully charged. And then once you apply heat or pressure to it, um, it discharges and releases some, some and so, sorry, solidifies and releases some heat. So this, the material changes from a liquid to a solid um, to release heat. That's really cool. I've always like wondered about those because I've, I've like always been using them. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So yeah, if you've ever came, been in the winter and used those yeah. heat warmers, that's what occurs. And it's the same principle for the, the phase change material storage system. So essentially, um, you're probably asking why we would use PCM materials over um, conventional hot water tanks. So Basically, um, the energy storage density is much higher per unit volume for the um, the phase change material, which means you can store a lot more energy in less space. So it's it's uh, if you've ever been in your house, you've probably got a massive domestic hot water tank that takes up a lot of space somewhere. So essentially, you can if you use a phase change material, you can store more energy in less space, which is very handy for houses and uh, small small scale houses as well who just don't have much room. And also there's the factor of um, water scarcity in the world with climate change. So for particular Dubai and arid countries, the water, like the fresh and domestic hot water supply that you would want for your, your hot water tank is very limited, especially in Africa as well. So you want a, a phase change material, which will basically allow you to not be reliant on water. So if there's no water, you can still store your, your thermal energy for your, um, both to create domestic hot water. Um, it also limits the heat losses as well. So when the heat dissipates over a certain amount of time, once it's fully charged, um, you have lower typical uh, heat losses from phase change materials than you would from domestic hot water um, tanks. And then you also want to consider the, the essentially the constant temperature for your energy when you're charging and discharging your cycles. So. Um, with phase change materials, it's typically a constant temperature when you're charging and discharging because it takes less time. 
Um, and essentially, if you're charging and discharging your hot water tank, um, the temperature will change by three or four degrees, depending on how long, um, depending on how the pump, how long the pump takes to um, supply it to the water fixtures or your shower. And sort of the materials that typically um, phase change materials are made from are they're either um, made from paraffin, which would be um, organic solutions, or they're made from salt hydrides or uh, inorganic solutions. So these are um, typically um, sustainable as well so, and recyclable. Um, so the salt hydrides uh, is typically sodium actate, which is commonly found in dishwater tablets and sometimes as a flavouring for salt and vinegar crisps. So it's like non-flammable um, and can be recycled uh, and has like a life cycle, a lifetime cycle of uh, 40,000 cycles. So this is just a quick section on obviously what you would typically find in a home is obviously your sensible heat solution for thermal energy storage. Obviously it uses uh, water as a medium um, you've got the tank, which is typically insulated to minimise the heat losses. Because the heat losses are, are quite more substantial than the PCM, it has a, a typically an insulated um, sort of skin inside the tank to, to prevent those heat losses being a major factor. Um, it also has um, uh, typically an internal coil uh, for an indirect system so that you can, it's essentially just a heat exchanger that you can charge um, via a boiler, typically. So this is just a section on showing you um, the temperature uh, at which um, latent heat storage occurs, uh, and essentially the uh, the sensible heat solution as well. So on the right graph there, um, it shows you the difference in um, the storage capacity. Uh, and essentially, you've got a solid sensible heat solution and a liquid sensible heat solution. But the latent heat solution um, at this at a constant temperature can basically discharge and charge um, without with the less heat losses um, in terms of the. So, the, for example, if you're trying to get um, hot water out and it was at 47 degrees, um, they didn't it would come out at 47 degrees or 45 degrees, whereas a, a, a sensible heat solution would come out maybe at like 43 degrees. So it would lose a lot of temperature uh, and the time it takes to trans um, to transfer it to the, the, fix, the fixings. So phase change materials are materials basically that change phase at a specific temperature. So for example, uh, I'm going to come to the Sunamp batteries in a minute, but they change um, temperature at 58 degrees. Uh, they also have um, lower phase change material temperatures um, that they call cool or cold batteries that change at um, 11 degrees. So they're quite flexible in their applications. They can be used for domestic hot water, space heating, or the, the higher phase change transition temperatures, um, or they can be used for chillers or refrigeration for, for the lower phase change temperature. So it's quite a flexible um, solution to have when you're storing energy. Um, and yeah, that's, I think that's all I need to cover on that slide. Um, sorry, the last bit I was gonna say there is that energy stored for a sensible heat, which would be water, is proportional to the temperature as well. Uh, yeah, so this part is on um, comparing sensible and latent heat uh, thermal energy storage, just from a sort of qualitative uh, viewpoint. So this is just a few parameters and a few considerations that you might want to think about when you're when you're coming to a decision on what storage solution is best for you for your home or um, depending on where you are. So um, key things to come from this is the cost. So obviously, sensible solutions are a bit more inexpensive. Uh, than the latent heat storage option but you can also if your space considerations obviously um are fairly constrained then you can go for the latent heat storage so solution because it takes up less space um and also um another point really is the 
thermal conductivity uh, is a lot lower um, for light and heat storage solutions as well. Right, so on this part of the um, presentation, I'm just going to show you the, a bit on the SUNAMP heat batteries. So a heat battery is essentially a high powered, high flow rate heat exchanger immersed in a phase change material and encapsulated in a sort of um, container typically made uh, of propylene. So obviously the cell around it is non-flammable and it's vacuum insulated. Um, so it's superior insulation and a minimal space, um, which is what you want with any thermal storage. You want it to be uh, well insulated so it minimizes the heat losses and you want it to have, take up as low a space as possible and um, so essentially you're just replacing your hot domestic hot water tanks in your home with this thermal energy storage unit yes yeah, so this is just um, a bit more on it as um, saying about the high energy density which i was explaining before so it's three to four times as much energy as heating up water in a domestic hot water tank. So you can get a lot more energy uh, in less space. It's high power as well. Uh, so you can rapidly charge uh, and discharge it. And in terms of the cost effectiveness, it's comparable to hot water tanks. It's slightly more expensive, um, but it's got higher efficiencies, lower heat loss, um, basically very little maintenance as well um, so that you lower your operation and maintenance cost over the lifetime which would typically be 40,000 cycles um, 40,000 cycles just means you can uh, charge and discharge it 40,000 times before you'll need to replace uh, uh, the heat battery because the phase change material inside will degrade over time typically uh, this happens with lithium, lithium ion batteries as well as you notice, your phone, your, your phone won't stay the full charge, its full lifetime. After about three years, your phone will degrade and the battery um, will become, you know, less. It'll have less storage capacity. This is just a bit on the sustainability aspect of the SUNAMP heat batteries. So SUNAMP heat batteries are made in Scotland um, originally. Uh, they're actually a University of Edinburgh startup um, that branched out. So they come in like many forms. Uh, you've got your organic, uh, inorganic, and a bit of a mix of a both um, solutions for the in terms of the phase change materials. The SUNAP heat batteries use inorganic materials that are known as sodium actate. Um, so it's plentiful in supply because, as I said before, it's um, in dishwasher tablets, it's in salt and vinegar crisps. It's a very um, easy accessible uh, material to get a hold of. Uh, it's non-toxic, which is important, obviously non-flammable. Uh, as I've said before, long life, uh, over 40,000 cycles with no degradation. Uh, and then basically, we're, you're able to fully reuse and recycle every component at the end of the life, which is very important if you're looking at sustainability, uh, life cycle costs, um, environmentally and obviously economically. Um, because when you want it to come to the end of a life cycle of a material or a component or equipment, you want it to be um, basically participate in a circular economy. So you want it to um, be able to reuse parts of the component or a device or be able to find another application that it might work in well. In. So this is just the wide range of storage temperatures that you can find phase changing materials that SunAMP produce. Um, units for. So they have a range of uh, units, um, thermal energy storage units that um, you know, known as the UniQ uh, range and essentially it goes from phase change materials at about uh, 11 degrees down to minus 14, minus 20, all the way up to 81, 118. So basically you would go from applications such as truck refrigeration for say um, food food shops like Asda, Tesco, to cold storage, air conditioning units, chillers, and then the sort of media, medium temperature range, you'd be looking at waste heat recovery um, and low temperature heat pumps. And then the sort of the range that we've considered for the house um, is the 58 degree uh, battery. 
breakfast that means it's got a phase change transition temperature of 58 degrees which is perfect for hot water and um, space heating as well um, and then you also have at the very uh, end of the scale there they've got phase change materials up to 118 degrees which is more industrial processes steam generation so recovering heat from uh, steam turbines that would be powering you know electricity um, and sort of large mechanical processes as well as um, thermal buffering as well. Uh, another thing that um, during the pandemic they sort of uh, focused on as well was um, vac safes. So essentially for the Pfizer vaccine it has to be stored in, um, at about minus 58 I think it is or minus somewhere in that range minus 49 degrees and they've developed also phase change materials that uh, will enable you to store vaccines uh, like, like like the Pfizer vaccine at low temperatures so that it can obviously uh, be used to vaccinate the population. Um, so this is just um, a demonstration on the size and the units available so they go from the UniQ3 these are mainly the the thermal energy storage units that have a higher um, phase change temperature about 58 degrees or 50 degrees um, so they go from the UniQ3 to the UniQ80 and um, essentially they have different equivalent cylinder sizes so normally your your typical um, hot water tank will have a litre capacity so from 70 to 100, uh, 280 litres so the uh, for the home we've choose the uh, UniQ9 range which is 280, uh, sorry, 210 litres and then it also shows you how much um, kilowatt hours of thermal energy you can store when, with the, when the battery is fully charged. And also there it gives you the heat loss as well. So uh, when the battery is fully charged, it'll lose uh, 0 0.65 kilowatt hours per day um, of thermal energy. So which is a fairly a very low um, heat loss coefficient when compared with uh, water tanks and domestic water tanks. And it also there's comments there saying it's also stackable, so um, save more space as well that way as well. Um, this is just to give you an example of the difference in this, the, the dimensions and the scale. So obviously on the left hand side, you've got the um, the, the conventional domestic hot water sensible heat solution hot water tank and you can also it's worth noting that the amount of connections and external components is also a lot more that you need for the so if you look at the simple we have just four basically connections into the heat battery and that is and there's typically be a pump and a few valves so there's a lot less system components that you need to be able to um, install a uniq a pcm uh, storage unit and it's also 71 percent less less volume um, to store um, probably three times the amount of energy so this is just a bit um a bit more on the type of uh, ranges that they do so as well as um charging the thermal energy storage unit that uses the phase change material with um solar thermal uh, you can also charge it um, via uh, PV generation um, as well as an option. And they also have the sort of fail safe, um, particularly for um, sort of Northern European colder climates. They have a, a standby electric heater because some periods of the day during um, during the winter, um, you might have very, very low levels of um, sun exposure during the day. So that means solar thermal is not really an option. Um, and you've got um, obviously PV as well. It can be generated by PV. So as a, as a sort of backup option, they have an, uh, sometimes you can get a, a version of the of the units that have an electrical heater, which is potentially would just be grid connected and powered from the grid to basically create your um, your thermal energy and store it in the, the phase change material. Um, so essentially the four connections that you have for the, the battery, you've got two of them are, are two heat exchangers and then the other two are just transferring the uh, liquids uh, into the, usually a cold water supply into the um, 
the, the unit itself. Now these PCMs are very uh, high grade, they're A grade, and they also have RAL certification, which is um, basically the highest standard you can get for a phase change material. Um, so basically, so is they're top of the range, they're non-toxic, they have good material safety, and um, they're not going to be catch on fire, they're not going to um, cause um, toxic or uh, uh, erosive, corrosive um, effects uh, if there's any leakage or um, those sort of considerations that are to do with health and safety. And essentially they're designed to obviously replace um, hot water tanks uh, from water cylinders that are like the, the sort of the, the gold, well not the gold standard, but the, the most common um, sort of if you're in a house, uh, particularly a, 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 not a new build, but a, a, obviously an old build or a, a, even a, a medium term um, build you're typically going to find uh, hot water cylinders in every single house. Um, so it's basically to, the idea of these uh, heat barriers is basically to, to displace um, hot water cylinders. So this is just a, a few of the technical specs. I'm not going to spend too long on this. Um, this is just um, considerations that you'd have to factor in when you're installing the system, doing the system design, so you have to understand if you're using buffer tanks with the system, what kind of working pressures um, are from the typically the heat pump or the or the thermal energy storage unit, and what kind of flow rates as well would you expect uh, when transferring um, liquid to the um, different uh, components in the system? Usually, your working fluid, if you're in a cold climate, it'd be glycol water mix, and if you're in a uh, typically just a, a warm climate, it would typically just be water. Um, the glycol water mix prevents the uh, the forking fluid freezing, which would damage the pipes. And obviously, cost you um, to replace and do maintenance on that. Um, and the, basically, the, the heat batteries are also controlled, um, so they control the charging and the discharging phases via a, a simple controller that monitors the temperature sensors within. Uh, sorry, it monitors the temperature via sensors in the system um, to basically. Um, provide logic and actuate um, depending on the temperature sensors outputs. Is there any more questions at all than this? Um, I think we'll be asking like we have loads of questions for you. <laughs> we'll all right. Be yeah. Okay so yeah this is just a slight bit on the battery controller so you can either um, uh, Sunamp provide their own battery controllers um, so Basically, essentially, it's a PLC controller. It's a programmable logic controller. So essentially, it's just um, a series of uh, logical states based on the the state of the the process. So if there's temperatures at different um, set points, or if there's certain conditions that need to be met to uh, charge and discharge the batteries, then the controller would process all that and um, obviously control the actuators, which would be your valves and um, pumps. You can also use what we're looking at into for the um, the house for the team of Steam Home is uh, using um, just a standard Raspberry Pi and a software set called OpenPLC, which allows you to build um, essentially a pro programmable logic, logic controller, which are typically quite expensive. Um, and often um, closed loop in terms of their um, data structure and use cases um, for automation processes. So it's allowed, uh, what we're considering is basically doing a more flexible system that can be connected to a, a building management system or um, or such. So yeah, there's kind of two options for the controller for your batteries, but typically if you're ordering a a Sunamp unit, they will give you a, a standard PLC controller that they provide um, for just a slight extra cost. But there is the option of doing it yourself, um, but they would, uh, Sunamp would want you to, obviously, um, they'd probably approve that and um, advise you on what solution to go with best to obviously reduce the risk of you damaging the PCM or um, uh, basically look at costs as well, how, how much it would cost you. Um, so this is just um, an example of different kind of systems that you can get uh, for solar thermal and thermal energy storage. So you can get um, just a simple drain back system with a booster pump, 
which typically uses is just a reservoir. And essentially, um, you're just monitoring the temperature uh, between the solar thermal collector and the thermal energy storage um, tank itself. And you're essentially just circulating um, water based on a control signal that's attached to a circulation pump. Um, the reservoir is basically just used as a, a buffer um, medium between the, the tank and the uh, collector inlet. So that's the most simple and straightforward system you can typically find. Um, the differential controller, it works as it says, basically um, the, the temperature difference between the two um, sensors. And these can typically be found um, online or uh, basically off the shelf components that you can buy. Uh, another option is to use a heat dump. So sometimes um, solar thermal systems, obviously, as I mentioned before, um, they have stagnation temperature, uh, which means essentially they overheat in periods. Uh, and the purpose of a heat dump uh, via the use of a blending valve is to basically dump the heat outside so that, that um, the overheating doesn't damage um, particularly the phase change material if you're using a, a latent heat storage solution. Um, so, for example, the phase change temperature of a, of a 58 PCM is 58 degrees, but anything over 65 degrees um, will damage the PCM and typically uh, well, in the case of the Solaris kit collector, the stagnation temperature is 80 degrees. So that is a there's a high risk that it might occur. So it's important to install in your design to potentially a heat dump or in some cases a safety thermometer, um, which will essentially actuate if the temperature um, goes over 65 degrees. And then that, that will basically stop the flows of the system uh, and save the PCM from getting damaged during stagnation of the collector. Um, another option, obviously, uh, sorry, of course, is to have uh, a backup heat source. So um, you have your conventional thermal energy storage, but you also want to be connected to uh, a second heat source and they'll essentially couple together so that you're maximizing the amount of thermal energy you're storing. Um, because there'll be periods of the day where your thermal energy storage system will be full or fully charged. Um, and you will still be gathering uh, solar gains. It might still be the middle of the day or near enough uh, two or three. So it's, uh, it's important to maximize the amount of thermal energy storage you're, you're storing, depending on your demand. So if your demand is quite high, you might have to have two thermal energy storage units, either sensible or latent heat, to cope with the demand. Uh, it's particularly applicable to industrial buildings, commercial buildings, more than obviously your just your standard um, residential home. OK, so lastly, and the, the point I wanted to cover really is um, just a quick overview on the on the team of steam system. So at the moment, we're trying to integrate both um, the higher PCM uh, phase transition temperature batteries, which are the 50 um, and the 58. And we've also got the, um, we also, so we're utilizing four um, thermal uh, energy storage batteries from Sunamp. Two of them have the lower phase transition temperatures and two of them have the higher phase, phase change transi transition temperatures. So we've got um, solar thermal collectors that are absorbing um, the solar thermal gains for the domestic hot water. And we've got um, essentially two um, lower phase change um, temperature uh, batteries for the radiant cool ceiling and um, the radiant cool ceiling for those of you not familiar essentially is just the opposite of underfloor heating where it's above the roof um, and it's essentially cold water that's basically circulated via pump um, in the panels above the roof and by this this effect basically chills the roof and um, so your any hot air rising cools down and that creates, it basically lowers your energy consumption if you're trying to cool a building um, because it's providing a passive cooling strategy that requires very low consumption um, circulation pumps. And instead of doing the, the ventilation uh, via a, a high speed fan, we also have it connected to um, our mechanical ventilation heat recovery system, which essentially um, is, is comparable to HVAC or aircon. Um, 
And as well as that, we have a, a heat pump with two interfacing buffer tanks, one for cold and one for hot um, water. And these are just small um, volume tanks, basically just to interface between the batteries um, and essentially um, dump the heat outside with the heat pump and also ensure that um, we're storing as much energy that's useful in these um, lower phase, tran phase transition temperature batteries. Um, so another important thing, just in terms of the system design, that I'm just going to bring up briefly is um, why essentially um, expansion vessels are required at uh, certain points of the system. Now this is due mainly because um, it's to basically maintain a stable pressure level within the system. So the, the working pressure sometimes can go from 3 bar to 6 bar to 10 bar max. Um, in the case of the um, the thermal energy storage hub uh, for this team of steam home. So it's important that you have sort of um, contingency buffers or um, expansion vessels so that you can cope with the pressure fluctuations, which can occur for multiple reasons within the system, which I'll not go into too much detail about, but it's to do with obviously the temperature changes um, and obviously the ideal gas law as well. Um, so yeah, just uh, this is just a, a few of the equations, just how to calculate that. Um, and then obviously you have your wiring of your battery controller as well um, that you need to consider, but it's a simple um, wiring setup with uh, just a typical controller, a uh, PLC controller. Uh, the last part that I'm going to cover is, um, this will be the first stage really that you do if you're trying to, trying to consider uh, solar thermal for the house or uh, looking at thermal energy storage units, either sensible or latent heat. You want to basically do an energy system um, analysis by a simulation on a modeling software such as Polysun or Transis. Um, and basically before you're carrying out your simulation, you must first define the following objectives. So you're looking at verifying the proposed system meets the application's uh, thermal load requirements quantifying the energy cost savings, um, approximating the annual auxiliary energy, uh, validating the storage tank size is correct. Um, this what you would do speaking to a plumber or a supplier, and then checking the performance of the proposed collectors, uh, which would typically come from data sheets um, from um, either your, your um, supplier of your solar, uh, solar thermal collectors, and then assessing the auxiliary boosting method, which would typically be from either a boiler um, or a low um, thermal um, conversion emulator. Um, if, but the, in some cases, the, the auxiliary booster method does not, is not required. Um, depends on your system setup. So on the left there, it's just a typical um, system with a potable hot water tank connected with um, solar thermal collector and here's just the heat exchanger uh, with pump and uh, a few controllers as well as a blending valve and then you've got your hot water demand and your cold water supply so this is just a fairly basic setup that you potentially have uh, and they use in this case they use a boiler as the booster um, which is not always so typically in some homes, you'd have the boiler, which is always supplying the, the hot water to the tank. Um, you would not have the solar thermal collector connected. But this is just a, a smaller boiler at 25 kilowatts to um, heat the hot water tank if required. Um, but most of the thermal energy to heat the, hot, to heat, the uh, heat the tank would come from the solar thermal collectors. So you do sometimes need this auxiliary booster um, just depending on your system demand or the amount of thermal energy storage uh, you have uh, and the amount of thermal uh, solar radiance gains as well, um, depending on where you are in the world. So for example, if you're in Dubai, you can have more uh, irradiance uh, than if you're, if you're in the UK. And that is it for me. Um, do anyone have any more questions or any questions at all? Hi, Kelvin. That was actually really amazing. Thank you so much for that. No worries. That was really good. <laughs>
Um, does anyone have any questions? So we have a question from Dami saying, so while dealing with solar thermal energy storage, what guidelines need to be kept in mind? Uh, yes, so it's usually you're building um, regulations and safety concerns. So um, you're looking at the um, building regulations for Dubai uh, or the UK. Um, typically, they'll have a plumbing section. Um, you also maybe want to get a, a plumber um, or speak to a plumbing agency just to look at the system pressures and the flow rates and um, to ensure they're, they're up to um, building standards. Um, but generally, so if you um, if you can get an uh, approved supplier of your PCM material, that de generally doesn't need to do any material safety data sheet tests or checks, um, because uh, if they get the cert certification, they can basically be deployed as a conventional hot water tank anywhere in the country. Um, you might want to check um, if it's in Dubai, UAE, if it's allowed. Typically, um, they want because of the, the safety standards in Dubai and with Diwa as well, they want to double check um, those safety standards. We also have a question from Madiha saying, which is better, solar PCM or thermal energy and why? Yes, yeah, so uh, in my opinion, or well, you say in my opinion, but basically um, there is a, a lot um, more benefits to having a PCM battery. Uh, as I said before, the energy storage density is much higher per unit volume, which means you can store a lot more energy, three times to four times the amount of energy um, in the, like half the space or half the volume. So you and also the connections um, are fairly simple compared to um, that for a, a sensible heat solution. So there's there's less room. Basically, it takes up less space. You can store more energy. Um, this, uh, it's also a constant temperature for charging and discharging during cycles. So you, say you want your hot water at 47 degrees mm. with a, a PCM, it's going to come out basically the constant temperature. So it's going to be coming out straight at 47 degrees. Um, if you're using a sensible heat solution, it's going to maybe come out at 43 degrees, even though you wanted 47, because of the um, the heat losses are not constant. Um, it's uh, proportional to the, the volume. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? And lastly on that, you also yeah. get low heat losses as well. Um, so oh, for example, when you, you, yeah, yeah, when you've reached fully charged, you get less heat losses, so. Okay. Um, would you say there's like a common like problem that are usually with solar PCMs that people aren't like not too sure what to? Um, I would say the the reason most people don't go for it is the um the expense and they don't see. And um, the value of it in terms of because um, people are just used to getting hot water at the tap every day um, in terms of uh, every house usually set up with domestic hot water tanks. So why would they change? Why would they change the boiler? Why would they change that? that? Um, and people are just aren't aware of phase change material technology, really, um, I think. Um, so it's about um, educating, I think, an educating piece and showing them the value of um, phase change material technology. Mm. That's understandable. Does anyone else have any qu more questions? So if not, uh, I want to thank you, Kelvin. That was a really good seminar. Right. <laughs> so um, after the seminar, I'm sure that all of us have learned a lot today. I'd also like to thank all the attendees for taking some time out to come today. Um, if everyone is okay with it we can take a little screenshot i'm also going to stop recording <laughs>